Okay. Thank you, guys. We are we are now reconvened in open session. Um, thank you, guys, for allowing us that that short break. Uh, we are now in the audience items portion. As you can imagine, we have a lot of audience items. I have not asked anyone to not speak or to consolidate this evening. We are going to go through all of them. Um, I would ask that if you can, uh, you're, you're allowed three minutes. Ms. Helliger will keep the time. She'll let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you can shorten your comments uh, to one to two minutes, that would help us get through them faster. So I'm just going to ask you to please consider doing that for us. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started so we can get through them. First up is uh, Dr. Indelicato, Anthony Indelicato. Oh, we're back. He's not. He's not going to do it? Okay. Well, that's one down. Um, <clears throat> is he not going to do it? Are you going to do it or not? <coughs> okay, we'll reschedule. Okay. Uh, n next up is uh, Linda Karam. You're going to go to the microphone right there, and it's the green light's on, so it looks like it's on. Miss Helliger will keep time for you, and she'll let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining. Okay. Go ahead. Good evening. Thank you for letting me, for giving me the chance to speak. My name is Linda Karam. I live in Riverstone, and I'm a sixth grader at FSMS. I want to share with you tonight my experience with rezoning. One of my friends at school recently told me that FBISD is wanting to rezone Riverstone students to a different middle school. She looked upset about the news, but I didn't believe her at first. I didn't think that could happen. I thought we had gone through rezoning once and could this couldn't happen to us again. But then I learned it could be true, and that brought back painful memories to me and many of my friends. When ASC opened two years ago, my siblings were rezoned there, but I chose to stay at CWE. I chose to stay there since I was already used to it. It felt like my second home, so I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to change schools. It would have felt like I would be moving to a new home with a new environment, with new students and teachers, and we would have to start the process of finding friends all over again. We would feel lost and unsafe for a while. In fifth grade, I struggled to make good friends throughout the year because all my best friends went to Sullivan. CWE was not the same without them. My friends would always make me smile, laugh, and cheer me up in fourth grade, but in fifth grade, it was silence. I felt like each of my friends was like, an, uh, was like a puzzle piece, and I had so many missing pieces. The puzzle, which for me stands for school, was so ugly with so many missing pieces. It was incomplete. I couldn't wait for middle school to be with my friends again. My puzzle is complete again. Please don't take that away from us again. And don't let anyone, don't let anyone go through that. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Angel Ackley. Good evening, Dr. Dupree, Madam President, esteemed Board of Trustees members and all stakeholders in Fort Bend ISD in, in attendance tonight. I am here tonight advocating for our children, for Riverstone students. I am a mother of four, and like most of Riverstone families, we moved into Riverstone having our kids' well-being and their education as our top priority. And now our kids' well-being and subsequently their academic experience is threatened. With the rapid growth of our communities, our schools are always getting overcrowded and the threat of rezoning is always haunting us because permanent solutions have always been slow to come. I've, been, I've seen firsthand what kind of impact the rezoning process has on kids. When AAC opened its, door, its doors last year, two of my kids were affected. Linda was one of them. Um, the rezoning process hit my second child the hardest as she was uprooted from her school. She had to go to another school and be in a completely new environment. For little kids, that's a lot to handle. It's true many of her friends moved as well, but she also lost many friends that remained at CWE. Even to this day, she still sits in front of her CWE yearbook remembering her old school and friends with tears in her eyes. 
And that's true as of two days ago. Kids need stability to thrive. Rezoning kids, especially when it's a repeated threat, shatters that sense of stability. We implore you to find permanent solutions and provide stability for our kids. When we asked for a new middle school to be built in Riverstone, we knew we weren't asking for the easy way out. As a parent who is very involved with volunteering at school, I know it takes a lot to start a new school. But we are willing to invest our time, our efforts, and everything for, we have for our kids. I wish Fort Ben ISD would invest a little bit more in our Riverstone students. We demand stability and no more rezoning of our, of our students. We would like our kids to remain in the same campus they start at and remain with the same friends throughout and at the transition from elementary to middle and middle to high. And if Fort Bayon ISD thinks that an addition to FSMS would ensure a permanent solution for our kids at the middle school level, then we are willing to work with you as long as our kids' emotional well-being is accounted for. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Is Ms. Collins still here? Did Ms. Collins leave? Oh, she can, I'll set it aside. Kelly Turnbull. <coughs> Kelly Turnbull. Okay. Um, good evening, board members, Dr. Dupree, and fellow ISD parents. While I am not involved in any of the rezoning um, or feeder pattern issues, I do have an issue with our school, Dallas Elementary. I have been a parent there for the last three years. And I am here this evening not only in support of Coach Aaron Young Morgan, but to ensure that no further disciplinary action is taken against him and hopefully affect changes at Dulles Elementary. Our motto this year is Viking Pride. Pride means the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. I applaud and admire the actions taken by Coach Young in order to protect our children, our own possessions. He took great pride in doing whatever it took to protect our children. As a mother, when I drop my child off at school, I hope that they are loved and protected as if they were in our own care, and he did just that. While I recognize the district cannot condone a full-fledged vigilante-type educator, we must maintain traffic flow solely des designed for the safety and well-being of our kids. That must happen. And there may well be a teachable moment for Coach. However, we must protect and defend any educator taking good faith measures to ensure the safety and well-being of our kids, period. Failure to do that would result in inhibiting our educators in performing their critical role. Coach Young was entrusted with the security of that perimeter and has been given all of the responsibility to keep our children safe from car traffic, yet has no authority, as we can see in this case. If a child had been struck or killed by that car, it would have been on him, and we would be having a completely different discussion right now. We have had two children struck by cars in front of our school on Dulles Avenue this year. And one of them, unfortunately, passed away. These occurrences have made us hypersensitive and hypervigilant about our children's safety. The passion and integrity displayed by Coach Young is a testament to the FBISD leadership. We hope that just as Coach stood firm when faced by an entitled bully, you will not bend under the pressure of a sensationalist media that glorifies the disrespectful actions of an irresponsible seconds. parent operating outside the lines, outside the rules. There is a petition that has been signed by over 10,000 people and over 4,000 comments have been left on this very moment. Um, supporting Coach Young and his efforts. Moving forward, I would like to know what type of changes you propose to prevent a similar or worse situation occurring in the future, perhaps bigger or more prominent signage. Fine. Thank, you. Thank you. Claude Foster. If, um, so I'm going to ask everyone not to applaud just because it, it takes time and delay. So I, I know you guys are approved. Claude Foster. 
Good afternoon. My name is Claude Foster. I'm a resident of Shadow Creek Ranch, and I have a daughter in the fourth grade at Blue, at Blue Ridge Elementary School. Like most par parents in Shadow Creek Ranch, I had hoped that Fort Bend ISD would have built a neighborhood school in Shadow Creek Ranch, as initially promised. Reg regrettably, that didn't happen, and our daughter is now at Blue Ridge Elementary School. Instead of complaining about her going to the school like so many other par parents in Shadow Creek Ranch, we rolled up our sleeves and got to work with other concerned pa parents and administrators to make Blue Ridge Elementary School the best it can be. We are currently working with school administration to revitalize the parent-teacher organization, has, which has been dormant since 1984. To illustrate my commitment to Blue Ridge Elementary, I'd like to read a thank you card I recently received from the principal. Mr. Foster, I want to thank you for your efforts to make Blue Ridge Elementary great. Your time and dedication are greatly appreciated. Parents like you help make our job easier. You are a blessing. Hashtag you, ma you matter. Signed, H. Welker. Here's the moral walk for the Fort Bend Independent School District. As parents at, at Blue Ridge Elementary, we want the same considerations of equity that parents receive in the wealthiest uh, neighborhood schools in Fort Bend ISD. We know we have challenges at Blue Ridge Elementary. We know we don't have the parental support that schools in wealthier part of the district have. We know many of the neighborhoods in the Blue Ridge attendance zone have many challenges. However, the moral voice asks who will speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. We believe you should. And despite your broken prom promise to build a neighborhood elementary school in Shadow Creek Ranch, we want to we want to believe that what you say in your mission statement for the Fort Bend ISD trustees is true, that your basic function is to provide local citizen supervision and control over education at a point close to the parent and child. And we hope that applies to Blue Ridge Elementary School, even though there was no mention of Blue Ridge in the master plan. We want the district to invest equitably in the uh, Willow Ridge feeder pattern we want the district to improve the facilities at Blue Ridge Elementary School. We want instructional programming, professional staff for wraparound services at Blue Ridge Elementary School. And we want a curriculum that increases critical thinking abilities and civic awareness. Therefore, we humbly ask that you keep Blue Ridge Elementary the way it is in the neighborhood since 1969. Um, and thank you for your time and dedication. You know, Brown versus Board of Education was all about that, uh, all about equity and equality, and we hope the board has the same goals and objectives. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Uh, Carlene Hodge. Hi, my name is Colleen Hodge. I am a parent at Blue Ridge. I am very involved in many activities from PTO to our Reading Buddies program. I stand before you a little overwhelmed. Um, I'm overwhelmed with all of the energy that has been put into um, plans and thoughts of rezoning or closing Blue Ridge in the Willow Ridge feeder pattern. Now, despite the more in-depth discussions here tonight, I question the silence um, when it comes to this feeder pattern, in particularly the last board meeting. There was zero time dedicated to this issue. And frankly, the silence was deafening. It really, really was. Um, as I look at your master plan, I see lots of words like rebuild, expand, capacity. But when it comes to the Willow Ridge pattern, I see a page, black and white page of fancy words, frankly. Excuse me. One of your proposals is to use Blue Ridge as a swing school while you rebuild the other elementary schools. My question to you is why not use Blue Ridge in the meantime to rebuild the school as promised. Like Mr. Foster said, it was built in 1969. So according to your policy, it should be re 
place or recycled about 40 years. And right now we're at year 49. I'm sorry. I have a really big headache. She's hungry. Yeah. She's hungry. It is my understanding that our elected officials are on board with keeping the doors of Blue Ridge open. What we need is capital funds to invest in to Blue Ridge and the feeder pattern as a whole. I hear your compassion for other schools, such as keeping our kids together in neighborhood schools. Um, when it comes to our kids, they're just as important, too. I need to hear that passion for them. 30 seconds. It is time to treat these families with respect. Like everyone else, do not take their humanity for granted. We don't have fancy signs or T-shirts. However, our kids deserve the same time and consideration as other feeder patterns that have been discussed here in great detail tonight. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And Tran? Good evening. Uh, thank you for giving Barrington Place Elementary the opportunity to express our concerns tonight. My name is Ann Tran, and I have a second and fourth grader at Barrington. For the past couple of months, there has been ongoing discussion about Barrington housing Meadow students while it was under renovation. It has only come to our attention as of last week that this was no longer the case, but that Barrington was going to be shut down and rezoned to Meadows. This understandably created chaos and confusion. The purpose of primary education is to provide our children with academic and socialization skills. But in order to foster that environment, our children need individualized attention from their teachers and school nurse. Currently, there is an average wait time for students to be tended to. Sometimes there are two to three kids sitting outside our nurse's office. If we were to be rezoned, the number of kids waiting to seek medical attention would easily double. Such rezoning would negatively impact access to all services across the board, including but not limited to computers, textbooks, and of the like. Secondly, in years past, my husband, children, and I enjoy the easy walk to Barrington. However, rezoning us would dictate that we walk our kids across the busy intersection of Jerry Ashford and Alston. In the mornings, this intersection is filled with motorists rushing to work. So needless to say, it would be unsafe to walk our kids and deter parents from letting their kids ride their bikes to school. Thirdly, shutting down Barrington would eliminate many jobs. Our teachers and support staff are some of the best educators and group of people my husband and I have befriended over the years. They are composed of individuals who are not just competent at their jobs, but genuinely care about their kids and take earnest pride in their work. Lastly, communication between the board and affected parents is lacking. The board's role is to govern and act as representatives for students and parents of Fort Bend, all students and parents of Fort Bend. So this recommendation can only be interpreted to mean that the board favors one school over the other. To reiterate Mr. Rosenthal's and Mr. Rice's points, it would be illogical to repurpose Barrington because one, we are a high performing school, and two, we have a population of 600 plus students, more than the other two schools that we would be zoned to. Rezoning would seconds. destroy the concept of our neighborhood school we are not just a neighborhood geographically bound by a physical designation. We are more than that. We are a community of parents whose kids enjoy their academic livelihood. A community of children who enjoy the safety and friendliness of their neighborhood. A community of residents who simply love our community. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for being here. Our next speaker is Diana Barrero Burgess. Burgess? <laughs> Good evening, Madam President, Steam Board of Trustees, Administrators, and Fort Bend Parents. My name is Diana Barrero Burgos, and I'm the proud mother of two talented students attending Barrington Place Elementary. My husband and I reside in a community of working professionals. We're part of an affluent community growing educationally and financially. This is why we are distraught to learn that Fort Bend ISD is considering closing 
or repurposing the jewel of a vast diverse community, our school, Barrington Place Elementary. I would like to reinforce that we as a community, we will not allow the repurposing of Barrington Place Elementary ever. And in fact, I'm here to talk about three key points against the recommendation of the committee. You're not the stakeholders in this community. First, the safety flaw in your plan. Second, Barrington Place, uh, Barrington Place Elementary as a school. And third, our students' academic success. First, safety is the concern for all the parents in the community and those surrounding communities that are being affected by recommendation number four. By closing re or repurposing uh, Barrington Place Elementary, our kids will be in real danger. Students from BPE who walk to school will be forced to cross three major streets with heavy traffic and with speeds stopping 45 miles per hour to get to other schools. BPE students who have to cross Derry Ashford Road to get to Meadows Place Elementary. Those students assigned to Sugar Mill would have to cross West, Port, uh, West Airport Boulevard and Eldridge Parkway. I don't believe the committee put enough thought to the recommendation. I doubt it Fort Bend ISD board members would like to be involved in a tragedy or have to endure a heavy lawsuit due to the careless recommendation and lack of safety concerns for students attending BP or any other schools. Second, let's look at some of the facts about Barrington Place Elementary. BP is a tier one school with a campus enrollment of over 680 students. This alone, the enrollment is to, is to have PPE stand alone as an elementary school. BPE has three out of six star distinction designation in academic achievement, in reading and mathematics. In addition, top 25% in closing performing gaps. Barrington Place surpassed the district's four performing indexes in 2017, scoring 88 in student achievement, 30 seconds. 48 in student progress, and 58 in closing performing gaps, and 58 in post-secondary uh, readiness. Third and final point, academic speaking, academically speaking, Barrington Place Elementary students outperformed the district as a whole on the START test with limited resources. Our students scored 71% compared to the district's 67%. Finally, I urge Fort Bend ISD Board of Trustees and top administrators to please leave Barrington Place alone and invest in new technology, Time. learning resources, and innovative and special programs for our children. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you for being here. Next speaker is Amy Leung. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and thank you for the points that you all have shared tonight. My name is Amy Learn. I'm a parent from Barrington Place Elementary and a member of the Barrington Place community for almost a decade now. We love our neighborhood and we love our school because it is the core of our community and a significant reflection of how our neighborhood is moving and growing. So when I heard last Monday of plans to possibly close down or repurpose our school, I, like countless others, was shocked. Our community understands this motion towards improving feeder patterns and ultimately lowering costs. What we don't understand is that a decision as impactful as this was made without including data and input from the very people who would be affected by this plan. We know that information was posted and was accessible to us. However, because the verbiage used to describe what's being proposed was not clear and direct, most of us didn't see anything alarming. We didn't think we were at risk, which is why you have not heard from us until now. There's a common language used here, but if the language is not accessible and understood by lay people, by the people these plans will affect, there will be a disconnect of communication and understanding, which is what we believe has happened in our case and is not equitable. Also, what, it has, what has been presented to us, including the current wording of the present pro proposal, does not clearly and accurately convey the kind of impact this plan actually has on our school. The words we have read were not alarming and clear enough for me to even infer that our school was in jeopardy. And the current verbiage used still isn't clear enough, which is alarming. Last Thursday, around 200 plus People in our community gathered in our cafeteria to discuss the future of our school, and I am still in awe of the turnout we have, despite having just two days' notice. 
Among the people that showed up were residents who were fairly new to our community, many of whom who chose to move here because of our school. Some of the people who attended this meeting were founding members of the community who poured in their time, money, and energy to make Barrington Place um, elementary and to make sure we were built. You can imagine how all this must mean to them, not only to have what they've invested be taken apart, but to also send students in Sugarland to another city, which poses more complications and frankly doesn't really make sense to me. What also doesn't make sense is that Barrington Place is a thriving school. We are a tier one school that is still growing and excelling in many ways. So why would you want to dismantle something that is flourishing? I urge you to not overcomplicate things and to please let Barrington Place Elementary continue to thrive by not disrupting in any way the rhythm and momentum that we have worked so hard to establish and to have a well-defined, clear, long-term permanent plan. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Our next speaker is Anna Pennings. She's not here. She was supposed to be crossed out. Okay. Uh, Wendy Pennings. Good evening. It was seven weeks ago today that we first heard about the potential option to close Meadows Elementary. We as a community quickly united together in an effort to keep our school, not only because Meadows Elementary on the inside has a strong community that makes for a strong educational environment, but also because Meadows Elementary is the heart of our one square mile city. My poetic fifth grader, Anna, um, captured it well when she penned this. The patch of empty space where my school once used to be would be equivalent to the giant hole in my heart. I think she so beautifully expressed how so many of us feel, and we as a community entered into this full force. As a community, we have attended board meetings, community meetings, steering committee meetings. We have spent hours reading through the documents, looking up and analyzing statistics, we have met and talked to steering committee members, administration, and board members. We have been fully committed to this process because we are fully committed to our school. The hours and hours invested in, our in the process were worth it because our school is worth it. Through it all, our th three main priorities have remained the same. First, that Meadows Elementary continues to exist within the city of Meadows Place. Second, to how, um, for it to be housed in a 21st century learning environment, and third, to keep our entire learning community together during the transition process. These have been our key priorities. I stand here today to first say thank you. Thank you so much for allowing us to enter into this process and wanting community involvement. We have felt cared for, we have felt listened to, and we have felt heard, so thank you. Second, I wanted to comment on one thing. In the presentation of the final steering committee, it made the comment in reference to Meadows Elementary. It said, 450 students seem small for this education environment. In my, in my opinion, small is not a bad thing. I think the school size of 450 is not too small for an educational environment. Our family has been to a large school and we have been to a small school. Our experience with Meadows Elementary has been completely different than our experience at the large school outside of the state. I believe that one thing that makes Meadows great is because of its smaller 30 size. Seconds. I'm not saying um, that large schools are a bad thing, but for our small community, I believe it is the best. So as you talk today and present, um, I am thankful that you have suggested rebuilding Meadows Elementary for 450 students with a core base of 600. I am also thankful that you have suggested that we stay together during the transition process. Board of Trustees, as you make your decision, I want to Hi. encourage you to vote what has been proposed. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm going to butcher this name. Uh, Kwan Yuen? Yuen? No. Okay. Linda Wu? Is Ms. Wu here? Okay. Uh, Orjanelle Lewis? I want to start by thanking this board for taking the time to reconsider its previous recommendation and keeping the high, high tower feeder pattern to get intact. 
I'm grateful that each of you took the time to hear our concerns and amend the proposal in a manner that would help to ensure success, not just for those in this feeder pattern, but in the entire Fort Bend ISD. We also thank you for the addition of the middle school for this feeder pattern, which, as you noted, can serve the Ridge Point and High Tower feeder patterns, especially if properly positioned. I ask that you consider the effect of removing academies from these schools and consolidating, consolidating them into solely one school. I ask that you work to improve the academic conditions at Willow Ridge and Marshall. Now is the time. Academies that are correctly implemented and supported is the best way. I noticed in reading the proposal that the board is considering adding new academies and innovative programs to ensure success at these schools. I love that idea. Let me take a few moments to suggest a few. A business academy, foreign language arts academy, a law academy, and an education academy. I would love to see this board create a law academy that would allow students to learn more about the intricacies of the legal practice on both the civil and criminal side. To my knowledge, this is not currently offered in the greater Houston area and would be extremely innovative. An education academy would allow Fort Bend ISD to be the first to prepare its students to be an educator and possibly come back home to work in the district that raised them. I also understand that many of the changes in this proposal are made in an effort to have our Fort Bend ISD out of district transfers and private school enrollees return back to Fort Bend ISD, their home district. I applaud this effort, effort and offer a suggestion. Offer GT classes in kindergarten. By offering GT classes in kindergarten, parents who presume their children are gifted will start and hopefully continue their kids' education in the district. Thank you again for allowing me to speak and taking these recommendations to heart. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Our next speaker is VJ. <laughs> Can you say that for me, please? Yes, sure. Um, VJ Anand Trunageshwaram. <laughs> I get it all the time. I have a speech. That's what I said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Good evening, respected Board of Trustees, I'm Madam President and Dr. Dupree. I'm VJ, short firm, from Riverstone. I was here in 2014 for the same factor. And now I'm again, not only as a Riverstone resident, more importantly, as a BASD community member, to bring forth few concerns about administration in front of the board. First one, the data integrity and quality. Data are the key essence of the final product of the proposals, any proposal. Master plan community or rezoning, data is the key. We as communities have major concerns over how the data, not just the PASA data, all the public data has been used and consumed in this proposal by third party company. Especially the concern is about oversight on this data usage. We have seen projections change from one presentation to the other, like from March 26th, from to May 5th, the same feeder pattern. And why? It is the same pass of data is being used. Why is being changed by the company? Being a company engineer consulting oil and gas company, even though the companies trust me full percent, but they do have a data quality team in place. Why I am surprised to see Fort Bend ISD doesn't have a data team. I actually called the Fort Bend ISD admin department last week, and I talked to Ms. Kimberly from Ms. Martini's uh, team, and she clearly said there's no such person or a team in place to do a data validation presented by a third party. And we have seen today Mr. Scott changing the data and saying things which is not in the presentation. We clearly can see that. Even $1 consumer product goes through quality check. Why not? A million dollar proposal, do a quality check from a post Fort Bend ISD. On top of that, data is being skewed towards only short term solution, not long term solutions. We get recommendation to build an elementary school. Example, Anselwen, four years or five years ago. Now we are proposing another elementary school for our same area. If you haven't taken a long term approach, like Ms. Adobe said, no band aid solution. We didn't have had this problem a long time ago. In last week's email from Dr. Shripri said, the primary driver has been to make decisions that are in the best interest of all students and to seconds. demonstrate the efficient and prudent use of taxpayers' dollars. I want to ask Mr. Dupree, do you really think that is the approach that has been taken today? And another point I want to touch on is 
Dr. Dubri always told us that it's a great to see engaged parents and community members in our community. Fort Bend County is one of the top counties in high number of bachelors and doctorates, and we take pride in providing great education to our kids. That's why we come out loud and clear when there's Hi. an issue with the kids. So the process needs to be changed. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, next speaker is Stuart Jackson. No, you're going to have to ask them, not me. <laughs> Hi, my name's Stuart Jackson, which all of you know, but it's for everybody in the audience. I've got three kids that have uh, gone to three different high schools or are going to three different high schools in this district. This district disrupted my family's life three years ago when they decided to cancel the academies. I had an incoming freshman at MSA and a junior at GSA. The community got engaged and you changed your mind. You obviously uh, missed me because now you're going to experiment with my kid who's going to Ridgepoint through this innovative uh, scheduling, which sounds like it might not pass, which is a good thing in my opinion. Thank goodness I only have three kids. Every few years this district goes to war on the banner of long-term planning. It goes, it, I guess long-term is defined as two to three years, which is not long enough for a family to pick a neighborhood to raise their kids with any certainty that those kids will stay in that neighborhood. It's not long enough for a student to select from the rich educational opportunities within the district with any certainty the selected path will exist when they get there or survive once they start. And it's not long enough to provide the general educational certainty that most families expect and deserve. This district's idea of long-term planning is on display here tonight. Spend months engaging the community and then largely ignore the output. This must be the case since many of the recommendations from last week didn't even survive the meeting last week with more dying tonight. So here we are possibly voting on innovative scheduling for Ridgepoint High School where every option is on the table up until the time the board decides. Long-term planning, not quite. And voting on academies where the only option that isn't on the table is the one that was rec recommended last week. When the demographic data that we pay so much for seems accurate, how do we find ourselves in this position? Is this district's community engagement really sampling the community or only sampling the part of the community that's always engaged? And when the decision is made, the rest of the community gets engaged or enraged. Um, <laughs> or are the results of the community engagement initi initiatives being marginalized? Whatever the reason, it's obvious that many of the recommendations from last week were not popular. If they truly are the result of massive community engagement initiatives, why so quick to throw them out and go to the second or third choices, or more accurately, all the remaining choices? Why not defend the choices and the rationale for making them? Unless, of course, we're not sure seconds. they do, in fact, represent the community, such as what we just heard earlier, where the steering committee recommended a ninth grade center and a rezone, and what was actually recommended was innovative scheduling for Ridgepoint instead. One of the most important things a parent can do in, is provide a predictable and stable environment for their children at home and at school. That's why all these people are here. So figure out how to truly listen to your constituents and provide them the stability they need and have every right to expect before they start voting with their pocketbook Time. and find what they deserve elsewhere. Thank you for being here. Next speaker is William Waldrop. Next speaker is Jason Doberlecki. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you to Dr. Dupree, to the Board of Trustees, and most importantly, thank you to all of these wonderful people sitting behind me. The engagement, passion, and cooperation between communities has been astounding. Thank you to Riverstone, Hightower, Siena Plantation, and the Ridgepoint community. Last week, I stood at this mic making a plea to be heard. We were demanding to have assurances that a long-term plan was being put in place and that we would not settle for another short-term band-aid approach of rezoning to kick the can down the road another few years. It's been a whirlwind week since last Monday. With several late night meetings, engagement with partner communities, conversations with some of the board of trustees and steering committee members, and state elected representatives stepping up to get involved. We couldn't be happier this past week to see our friends at Hightower spared from having their community school repurposed as an academy and having their kids sent outside their community. I was ready to stand here and say thank you for hearing us in Siena and Ridgepoint High School as well. 
based on those conversations in the draft document posted just a few days ago. But it seems much of that capacity talk in the draft document in the drafted document posted earlier this week is out. What happened to the land for high school? What happened to using new middle school as a pressure relief valve for the Ridgepoint High School capacity issues? Now as I digest the info for tonight, it seems we're back to square one. Despite the frustration, we look forward to being engaged and involved in the next steps. We stand ready to be a partner as the district solidifies a long-term plan to provide stability, given that it includes a middle school and a high school that are so desperately needed. I do have to wonder why long-term growth needs in the eastern portion of Fort Bend County have been largely ignored and why it took this week to be heard. The growth has been a surprise to no one. Your own PASA data dating back to at least 2007 has been sufficiently accurate to have prevented this situation, yet here we are. As Ms. Tessin was quoted in today's article on cron.com, quote, we can't keep moving our kids around from one box to another every three to five years, end quote. We look forward to being a partner to ensure that this is not the case, and so those of us in Siena Plantation and surrounding communities can breathe a sigh of relief for our children's education. You've awoken a large and cohesive community that is ready to further organize to hold the district accountable. Accountable to the promises we've heard tonight, accountable to building school capacity in the east side of Fort Bend County, accountable to transparency in these procedures, accountability to the teachers and administrators in our schools who bear the brunt of your decisions that you make, and accountable to the communities and voters of this county. While I thank you for the seconds. steps taken from this last week, we're not going to return to complacency. Know that we're here watching and we're finding our way to have better representation in this process so that all of our kids get the community-based facilities and education that they all deserve. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Ansh Anshumi Havari? Havari? I hope I said that right. Hello, respected Board of Trustees, administration, and community members. My name is Nshimi Javeri, and I'm an eighth grader at Quail Valley Middle School's GT Academy, and soon to be Viking at Dulles High School's Math and Science Academy. Going to the GT Academy has shaped me into the person that I am today. It has provided a sense of nurturing, which is essential to the middle school years. The Academy has allowed students to experience what it feels to be like in a cohort. With teachers that treat students like their own, and students that work together for common goals, it becomes a place extremely hard to let go of. It leaves students longing for similar love, challenge, and culture in high school, and any type of education in their coming years. A program is built by the campus that it resides in. Many of us chose the Math and Science Academy, not only because of the pro program content, but because of what Dulles' campus gives to us personally. It is centrally located in the district, has amazing teachers, and provides a cohort. For young minds, being able to experience this cohort is a blessing. A cohort is not only comprised of students, but teachers as well. These teachers are not tied or affiliated to the academies, but to the schools. If we move these academies, we risk losing these teachers, which are the backbones of these programs. The programs at the Math and Science and Engineering Academies are impeccable, and if rezoned to a school on the far east end of the district, there will be a plethora of students, including myself, who will not be able to reap the benefits of the academies due to distance. Students like to be engaged in their school communities. Many parents won't be able to drive this distance if their student wants to participate in after-school activities. Why should any student who has been accepted be denied the academy experience because of distance? I believe that school should be a place where everyone is allowed to walk in their own shoes and be themselves without fear and ambition of who they are. Quail Valley does. Not once have I ever felt like the odd one out for having a passion, liking something different, or being different. At the academy, students are supported in all of their endeavors. I am the president of NJHS, have been to various competitions at the state level, and you just recognized my team to making it to globals for DI. The academy has supported me throughout my accomplishments and has challenged me through the hard times. The academy has taught me that it's okay to struggle and that you can get through it. Going to the academy is an experience which shows me every day what it's like to be surrounded with students that have passion, are focused, and ha are driven. As an incoming freshman for Dulles, I have seen this passion and focus in the current students of the MSA. Being able to attend a school where students share similar goals just pushes every child to work harder. The academy is my family. It is my home. My peers for the last three years share bonds as a student body that are unbreakable. From staying up late seconds. to do projects, laughing at silly drama, supporting each other throughout every step of the crazy roller coaster ride known as middle school, I will forever be connected to the school that I believe has raised me. 
I chose Dulles because of the rigor, passion, love for education, effort put into cultivating young minds, and love for innovation. But more importantly, the culture, pride bound between the student and its campus. I'm urging you not to take away that academy experience from me, which I'm so much looking forward to at Dulles. I'm inviting you to speak to incoming freshmen and hear them out. Fort Bend ISD has always been a district that listens Hi. to the voices of students, and today we urge you to listen to ours. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Rakesh Kumar. Rakesh Kumar. Hi, more. Hi, more. Still stack. Oh, God. Hi, my name is Rakesh Kumar, and really thank you, all the board and the district, to allow me to talk here. <clears throat> So as you can see on my t-shirt here, I'm really a proud parent of a program which is really supported, supporting my kids. I have two kids, one in the middle school, Quail Valley Middle School, as an academy student, and one in the <clears throat> Dulles High School, again as an academy. And I'm also very proud to stand here to say they have represented the state, at the state, as well as at the national level. But this is not because he did it. It's the whole community did it. It's the school which did it, right? The students have put their efforts, but it's the teachers who make the program. They learned the first year. He couldn't make it the first year. But the next year, the teachers learned with them how to make these things happen. How? What are the needs of these kids? Then the parents, they have been putting enormous effort in the PTO, how to get the equipment, how to get the funding, which the district cannot provide in order to get this. And this is what makes a academy it is not a piece of equipment or a piece of decoration which you can just move around when you want just because it is feeding that so it takes a lot of effort it has started bearing fruits your own website now prides about physics bowl five years consecutive national place national science bowl third place winners fifth place winners and then chemistry bowls I can just keep on naming, but this has come over time. Recognize this and don't move things just because you have to. Things which are working, don't break them. You don't fix things which are not broken. We have experimented with things which have not worked with us. It's okay, we experimented it. And we talked, we heard about the IB program, the GSA program, the GPA things. This is one thing which is working. Please don't try to fix something which is not broken. Next, I really thank the board on taking the same viewpoint as I had on the rezoning. I consider moving the kids around also rezoning, the academy kid also as rezoning. They don't, they, are they not the kids? They develop their partnership with the school. They develop their relationship, not only with the GT Academy. My daughter teaches the other kids, tutors the kids. She comes seconds. back and talks about the story. So she, they are developing a relationship there in the community and they want to be there. So don't try to, don't fix things again which is not broken. And let's not add to their, st all the already stretch. They are achieving this at their, a lot of time this span. Let's not add additional travel time. For some kids, it could be taking almost half of their time from their free time, which they were using to ex time. move this. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Our next speaker is Sushane Cherivarala. Hi, I'm Sushane Cherivarala, an alumnus of Dulles Math and Science Academy's class of 2015 and incoming graduate student at Stanford University. As a senior, I had the honor of serving as president to the Academy's diverse and brilliant student body. I'm here to stress how the facility's master plan recommendation number 11 will revocably disrupt the educa education and success of current and future students for years to come. Teachers are the cornerstone of the Math and Science Academy. The district employs math specialists, reading specialists, and many others. It isn't in their job titles, but the teachers at the academy are specialists in their own right. They're specialists in teaching, teaching challenging courses offered at only a handful of places in the country at the highest school, high school level. We identified courses like biotech and modern physics not only with their content, but also the extraordinary ability of their teachers to inspire us. The countless emails Dr. Poche received from former students recognizing OCHEM as being a catalyst for their choice in major and acquiescing that the tools of OCHEM at Dulles were invaluable testify to the potency of these teachers. But they're not just specialists at teaching. Their experience with extracurricular activities is unparalleled. 
the weekend, the weekend Sacrifice by Ms. Malone, Ms. Kaufman, Ms. Matney, and many others in ferrying students to competitions across the country pale in comparison to the endless evenings dedicated to overseeing practice sessions. The consolidation proposed by the master plan ingenuously provides no substitute for this ind indispensable part of the academy system. The years required to train a new set of teachers will be disastrous to current students and rob future students of countless opportunities. That's not to mention the inescapable onus of on already overburdened teachers to choose which group of passionate students they can dedicate themselves towards serving, the robotics club or the math club, both of whom need to, are eager to attend a competition next week. The master plan's second proposal to restructure existing academies and centers that students are periodically shuffled to is no less questionable. The math and science academy students constitute a community forged by shared experiences and common passions. It's this sense of community that spurs students into everything from running for the academy council and securing former NASA speakers to assembling a na national winning science bowl team of their own volition. This isn't a community formed by sitting in the same classroom a couple hours every day. It's a kinship derived from rubbing elbows in the hallway, socializing during lunch, attending the same organization meetings after school, and collaborating on group projects. The proposed center's approach is akin to eliminating recess from elementary school and still expecting students to blossom. It's unrealistic and it treats students as mathematical functions from knowledge to achievement, a sure recipe to discourage students from testing their limits and unlocking their potential. I see on the table a restructuring that is destined to destroy community bonds and a consolidation that will effectively reset the hard-earned experience and reputation of the district's academies, dramatically narrowing available opportunities. I implore the board to consider not only the international and national achievements of these students, many of which have been recognized here, Few and few of which would have been possible without this critical mass of students and experienced instructors, but also the exceptional community they've built, one envied across the state. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Gerilyn Prince. Hi. Um, just really briefly, I wanted to make a suggestion to the board. I heard a lot of comments regarding the academies and where they would not be successful or where they weren't successful in the past. And it also falls in line with the conversation about rezoning and, you know, certain communities saying that they really didn't want their kids rezoned to those schools or to these schools. Um, I'm asking you guys to consider why that is and what can we do to change that? Not just to write the schools off and say, it's not going to work there. We can't do it. We tried it. Why will we write off half of the schools in our district, it seems like we would want them all to succeed. Um, we all as parents have an opportunity to move our kid, move ourselves anywhere we want so that our kids could go to certain schools. But a question I had to ask myself when I considered moving my son was, do I just want to move him and write that school off? Or do I want to leave him there and fight for Fortman ISD to make that school better? Or to make that school a school that you don't have a bunch of people booing when you mention it in a town hall meeting, um, which is kind of disheartening. And I, I just wonder why as parents and as board members, we find that acceptable. I would think that we wanted all the schools in Fort Ben ISD to be desirable schools. So why wouldn't a, um, an academy program be successful at Marshall? Why wouldn't it be successful at Willow Ridge? It should be. Maybe we should work towards making it to where those schools are successful or those programs would work in those schools or figure out what would work. If it wouldn't be the academies, maybe it's something else. Um, Thurgood Mar uh, Marshall Law Program. Maybe it's something else in that area, but let's just not write off half of the district and say, uh, can't go over there. It's not going to work because that's not fair to those kids. So that's really all I want to say. I'm not even going to take the whole time. I just, I want to figure out why. And I think that's, that's the question we're not asking. Instead, we're just saying, eh, we can't go over there. That's not going to work. Not that school. You know, instead, make all of the schools equal. Every school in our district should be a school that parents are proud to bring their children to. There should not, and I'll say that again, there should not be a collective booing when any school in this district is mentioned, period. Thank you for being here. Next speaker is Shannon Lynn. Next speaker is uh, Parna Prashar. Good evening, Dr. Dupree, Madam President, esteemed board trustees. A big congratulations to the reinitiation for the both of you. 
but a bigger applaud i think to the entire board the organization on this achievement being district of the year i think speaks a lot about fort bend isd it is not just all your hard work but a community and board collaboration that can make that happen my speech looks nothing with what i came with which i think is a good thing because what i feel standing here today after the past four and a half hours <laughs> is that we are being heard you you know what we want we are talking about news no rezoning we are talking about no band-aids no no temporary fixes where we are I'm going to be at the same crossroads four years from now. It happened four years ago. It's going to happen again, looking at some of the recommendations made here tonight. And what I heard out of all of that was that the board itself and all of you guys also feel what we are feeling, that these recommendations are not complete. If we say, okay, build a new school, really? Is that it? And then how much is it going to cost? But we don't have the answer for that, which doesn't help you make that decision decision i feel or if you're saying um uh make additions but we don't really know as a comparison what it's going to actually work out in numbers so like i said my speech looks nothing like what i started with and this is what i've just captured from the past couple of hours sitting here and being a riverstone resident what i have seen uh and we have been this has brought us together as a community I don't stand here as a Riverstone parent anymore. I stand representing everybody sitting here because I think we're all talking about the same thing. Don't move the kids around. Let's see if we can make those additions where it is a financially feasible proposition for the board and for the parents to be happy and the kids be where they want to be or where they belong. Um, I'm going to go back to our feeder pattern for Clements and Elkins where we're talking about the middle school additions. My only request there is ideal situation is that we get a new middle school so that Riverstone has that clear feeder pattern into Elkins and there is no over capacity, over utilization at any of the other middle schools. But until then, we do need to fix this problem because what I saw is 30 seconds as per some of the data shared. Uh, there are some schools that reach capacity at 107 percent, whereas others like Fort Settlement at 148% are also we are still talking about additions and not something more long term. So just as a request, if we look at adding additions to both Fourth, uh, fourth Settlement and First Colony, because if not, Hi. we will be back here in a couple of years. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, next speaker is Tammy Marino. I never thought it would come. Hi, everybody. I'm so hungry. I might faint. Um, <laughs> so like some of the others, I had a very thorough speech prepared, but I'm so pleased to have seen the dialogue that we saw tonight, which I think, Kristen, you touched on. It was missing at last week's meeting. Um, I think for us on this side, we know that there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that we don't see, but sometimes there are things that we need to see. And some of that is our board questioning our administration and questioning recommendations that are put in front of them and not simply giving them a glowing, yay, sounds great, let's do it. Um, and I like that we saw a lot of that tonight. But I'm going to hit a little harder on the Marshall and Willow Ridge question. I think that, again, I've been at this mic for 10 years asking about Marshall and Willow Ridge and when we are going to do something for these schools, something real, something concrete and something impactful, like when. And every time we have a rezoning, we touch on potentially rezoning populations into those schools and it always ends up shot down because of community pushback. And when we were here five years ago, it was shot down and we were all told that Marshall and Willow Ridge were going to be addressed for those four years, that we were going to look at improving performance, but also more importantly, improving public perception of those schools. So like Geraldine said, so those schools are not booed at a, in a town hall forum. Um, and none of that has been done yet. So it should not be a surprise to anyone that four years later, still no one wants to go to those schools. I think it's time to really invest in those schools, again, either via 
via population or programs or a combination of the two. Um, and I'd really, what, what pains me, and full disclosure, for those who don't know, I don't live in the Marshall or Willow Ridge feeder pattern. I live in the Clements feeder pattern. But to me, it doesn't matter how great Clements is, as long as Marshall and Willow Ridge are lying there completely unaddressed and ignored. And to see all of these recommendations and to see how some of them are spelled out so clearly and how Marshall and Willow Ridge, it's just a paragraph saying, we'll look at programs. I get it, and I think that's a step in the right seconds. direction, but with all due respect, we should have been looking at programs for the last five years. So it's a little too little too late, so let's like step on the gas and figure out what those programs are and get with those communities and find the programs that are gonna work for them and implement them yesterday. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Our next speaker is Stephanie Brown. Hi, my name is Stephanie Brown and I'm here to represent Marshall High School as well as Willow Ridge. Um, there was a question that you asked KP George about uh, the academies that was at Marshall in the beginning. Really no one could ask to answer that question. I was the one that kind of blurted out. I apologize for that. But the two academies were the GIS Academy and the Engineering Academy. And they were very successful. And I'll tell you because I've been there since the school opened. I had three kids to graduate there. I don't have any kids now, but I still volunteer there because I want to see the school excel. The Engineering com uh, Academy uh, became very successful. We had scholarship students, got scholarships to Purdue. Uh, they formed partnerships with Schlumberger. We got uh, funded. They got internships. It was a very successful program. But during that time, um, the, the board or the superintendent at that time gave us a challenge and said we had to have X amount of people uh, or they were going to take the academy away. Well, when you put an academy at Marshall against opening a new academy at Elkins, who do you think they're going to go to? And that's what happened. And then they brought over the uh, IB program and competed with the engineering academy, moved half the students to the IB program, which eliminated some of the students from the engineering academy, and so the rest is history. Needless to say, the academy moved to Elkins, and we were without an academy. We ended up with an engineering um, class, and that per that uh that engineering class got sent over to Willowry. So needless to say, I'll make a long story short, throughout the years that I've been there from 2002 till today, they have just taken and taken and taken away from Marshall. And that's why I'm so passionate about it because I've seen wonderful teachers when the school first opened, we had excellent teachers, excellent students. Our 2010 class uh, beat Elkins in the state exams. So when you start talking about what our kids can do, I could tell you what they can do. We have successful, dedicated teachers there. But we have teachers that are there today telling us that they're trying to take them away from Marshall today and send them to other schools. Why is that? So my plea to you is whatever it is that you have as far as resources, our students are there to learn. Give us what we need so our students can be successful. And I, I really applaud you, Addie, for being a voice on the board for Marshall and these three schools that seem to have been a drive by on the uh, minds of the board members or whomever may have put the uh, paragraphs up there about what you have planned for our school. I think we needed some kind of documentation of what your plan is concrete because a drive-by statement of you want better outcomes or you want to see innovation things what kind of innovation things you haven't given us anything to go by so when you put a, a plan up there for marshall willow ridge and high tower give us something to work with thank, thank you for being here next speaker is cynthia gary let's see her yeah i don't think she's here either. rama man uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, the board, Dr. Dupree, and the FPST administration for allowing me to speak on behalf of our community. My name is Rama Manne, and I live in Riverstone. Uh, my daughter graduated from the Global Studies Academy two years ago, and she is currently at uh, UC Berkeley. 
Our River Stone community was rezoned in 2010 and again in 2014. Here we are again in 2018 talking about yet another rezoning. I'd like to highlight the following points. River Stone is a master community, about 6,000 homes. There's another 1,100 homes yet to be built in the area. And we are next to Siena, which is uh, planned to be 16,000 homes, yet to be uh, built, uh, supposed to build another 5,200 homes uh, in the next 10 years. So we are looking for, in the southeast uh, side of the district, long-term solutions, no more band-aid. We, we need to stop this constant re rezoning. We need stability, long-term solutions for our community that has been deeply impacted by Hurricane Harvey. Um, I want to give out some data points. Um, I think it's already been clearly recognized at the elementary level. There is a clear bust. Um, there is a capacity shortage of 825 uh, students in, by 2027 in the first colony in Riverstone areas. Um, and with a projected balance utilization of 117%. Many of the elementary schools in the area need major renovations. Even a temporary closure of the smallest elementary school will create a capacity shortage of 1460 and make the balance utilizations uh, jump to 134%. There is clearly a need to address elementary capacity shortage in this area. So if we make um, the middle school a little bit bigger, uh, cover the entire southeast portion, right, including Siena, um, you're looking at a clear capacity shortage of 1,057 in First Colony, Riverstone, and Siena areas. Even with the opening of the second middle school, Thornton, and Siena, the, with a projected utilit utilization of 91% next year, um, by 2027, the balanced utilization of the four middle schools in the southeastern area will be 120%, with more projected growth in Siena beyond 2028. Um, so our community would want to see a plan seconds. that would address this capacity shortage. Also, you know, as... Uh, as already noted, by 2027, the high school capacity shortage will be 1840. If you take the current zoned areas of Clements, Elkins, and Ridgepoint areas, the balance utilization of all these three high schools will be 120%. Again, um, more projected Time. growth in Siena 2028. So, thank you for no, thank you for being here. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melanie Anbarsi. Melanie. Next up is uh, Saqib Miman. Saqib, it's left. And Shannon Tossian. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Administrations, Dr. Dupree, all of you guests. As I knew tonight, you'd probably be lobbied for many things probably criticized, and I think you were even mocked a bit. Um, I wanted to make sure that we represented all of us in the district who are extremely proud of the work that this board and this administration and the district as a whole has done. And to congratulate and thank you for this work and the great results that you have achieved for the children of Fort Bend ISD. This job is not easy. Our public schools are under attack in many ways, as you well know. Our state government continues to increase the requirements and decrease your funding. They criticize districts when they build buildings, and thus they want to make it harder to pass bonds. Education 10 years from now is likely to look very different than it does today. But this district and this team has managed to thrive in this environment, and you've delivered superior results. You have less schools and improvement required. You became a district of innovation. You put in place programs and supports for our at-risk populations. You've adopted the profile of a graduate, built and commissioned many new schools, put in place new pathways and expanded options for our students, and many, many more things. You don't back down from doing the hard work required to get to the best outcomes. Last year, the board was declared the best board in the state of Texas. Just a week ago, the district was declared the best district in the state of Texas. These are major accomplishments, and they deserve to be celebrated. So congratulations to Grail and Addy for your re-election. It was well-deserved. And congratulations to all of the board, Dr. Dupree, the administration, and the teachers.
for all of your accomplishments and the recognitions of them. On behalf of those of us who watch this process regularly, who see the passion for all kids, the hard work you put in every day, thank you for persisting through and never giving up on sorting through all of these many constraints and desires that are presented in front of you to really get to the best solutions and improve the lives of our children in Fort Bend. Congratulations and thanks. You guys rock. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, that concludes audience items. Um, so we are going to move on now to our 2018-19 budget update. Dr. Dupree. Yes, as you know, next month the board will be asked to adopt the budget for the 18-19 school year. So we wanted to provide you an update um, about some critical actions that are also included on this agenda that will be impacted by this budget. So Steve will and his team will do their best to move through this as expeditiously as possible. But please feel free to ask us any questions that come to mind. I think my teammates are upstairs, but I'll get started with the presentation. Okay. Whew. All right. <laughs> Are we ready? Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Pree. So uh, we are going to walk through our uh, budget where we're at today. Uh, we have our uh, property value updates. Speak about that. Our general fund and how that uh, shaping up. We have a three-year outlook for you. We're going to spend some time for the first time on the debt service fund to update you on how we're doing with that, and then also the the child nutrition fund. So we've received our preliminary tax roll for April 30th. Uh, long story short, we're still looking at 3% you know, growth for the uh, for the current year. Um, you know, so the numbers really didn't change from what we spoke to you about whenever we were together last time. We still have the impact of Harvey of you know 97.7 million. Uh, so, so can we, we ask the people outside to please quiet down? We have a, a speaker. It's hard to hear. Thank you. So we've lost a little bit of revenue from that. Uh, but so there's no new news on our property values. The the assumptions in the gold that we have here are the new assumptions. We've walked through these other ones before. Uh, we've made revenue adjustment of two point nine million uh, additional from uh, the sped uh, the sped students that we're expecting uh, special education. There is uh, some additional revenue associated with that growth doesn't offset the total expenses we've discussed before. Um, we are expecting an additional contribution from extended, uh, the extended day program, part of the extended learning um, organization. That's going to be increasing uh, by 500,000. Uh, the other staffing needs uh, were outlined in the agenda, 10.5 million for 168 FTEs. So here's that list of the, of the other staffing needs, 85 FTEs in special ed, uh, 47 for the early literacy center that had already been approved. Uh, uh, ELL staffing nine, fine arts five. Uh, then we're also we have the uh, the center startup for the CT center, 0.7 million. And then we ha do have a teacher pool to be able to help us make you know quick reactions whenever we do need to add uh, faculty members. Steve, I'm going to make a suggestion if the board is agreeable, just in the in the essence of time. The next several slides are good information, but I think they're things that we could send the board and then maybe address at the next meeting when we do the public hearing. I don't think they're essential to the, the bottom line budget. They're informational about how the board, how the budget is addressing the board's goals and that kind of thing, which is important. But I think they can read that and we can talk about it maybe at the next meeting. So I would suggest you, you skip to slide 16 to kind of get to the proposed budget and then move um, through the rest of it. There. And if you could hit the highlights for us. Uh, okay, so the highlights that we, okay, so. Um, Brian's here if you wanted him to do his job. <laughs> Mr. Gwynn, nice. It's, it's 11 o'clock. We're, 
Yeah. We're all, we're, yeah. Doing, I think we're doing fine here. So, so anyway, <laughs> uh, they, long story short, I mean, we, we're, we're looking right now at, at a loss in the current year, 17, 18. You know, just under two million. You know, so we're hoping to you know break even. A lot of things have been happening. We've had a lot of moving pieces, but that allows us the flexibility to still have the economic stabilization fund in place for eighteen nineteen. And so right now we're anticipating using five points uh, five point nine million of that. And so the important part is that if we adopt the budget with the numbers that we're showing you today, uh, we would still be well within the ninety day policy, which is one of the main things that we look at in terms of our um, uh, the uh, the rating agencies whenever they take a look at us. And they just recently did because we did a, a bond deal. So having that 90 days of fund balance uh, to be in court of board policy is really the, the important thing. So we're still in great shape from uh, uh, from the use of economic stabilization. So that's really the I mean, the, the highlights. Uh, if we go, though, through the out year, so looking at Property growth for 3% in those in the coming years, assuming no change in state funding and no, no help from the state on what happened with Harvey. Uh, and then we know we're going to be opening the CT Center. Uh, we're going to have new teaching staff when we have enrollment growth. We're looking at the teacher step increase, but also we're going we're gonna to need to plan on raises in the future years. This is what it could look like in 1920 with those preliminary numbers. A uh, uh, deficit of $23 million in 1920 and 32 million in 2021. Again, that's with raises built in. Okay, so you know we definitely are going to have work to do in the future, uh, or we're going to have to look at uh, uh, TRE, or we're going to have to see what happens whenever the uh, the state uh, does something. Hopefully, with uh, uh, with Harvey property value relief, which is something they've said that they were going to do. So this I, I see is the kind of the the bleakest the bleakest scenario in that regard. These numbers are not uncommon compared to our peer districts and what they're what they're out there saying. I mean, as a matter of fact, these for the size of our districts, these are a little light in terms of the the deficits that that my brother and my other CFO friends are, are doing with the other districts that are out there. If you uh, if you read on any of their any of their presentations. So that's it on the general fund side. If you want to if, if I want to take any questions on that now, or do you want me to just push into the, uh, the debt service. Do we have questions on the general fund side? Mr. Rice. Mr. Bassett, my question is on the property values update. We had a presentation from Mr. Gunn several weeks ago saying that the 10 percent increase in 2014, 10 percent in 2015, and 11 percent in 2016 was due to Riverstone, and now that growth is slowing. Well, we've heard tonight about a lot of growth in Siena. Has he factored that in? Is is that included, or this anemic 2.9 percent property cap growth is that projected to increase over the next several years? I, we're optimistic that uh, we will see higher growth in the coming years, higher than three percent, which would be helpful to us. But uh, we're trying to, you know, be conservative in terms of the, in terms of this out long project, this uh, uh, out year projection. But the but the Siena growth is included in these in these numbers. It is included. Yes, sir. In, in so far as you can see into the future, it is included. Okay. So knowing that that when the state of Texas gets ready to write us a check, they look back at our property growth from the previous year, and it always catches us in the tail end. What will the state do to our funding formula if our property growth were flat or even below uh, we had negative property growth? What would happen to the funding formula? Well, eventually, I mean, if you, if you do get to the point where the property value is going down, that you know, the state does does put in more eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there would be a year lag on that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Um, if we do have five percent growth next year, you know, then we'll get the benefit of that, you know, for a year until the state right. pulls that back the, the following year. But eventually, if we do go negative as we did last decade, okay, the, the state does kick in more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I, I know that we the teachers need raises, but. I hope you know I could never vote to have a 
$23 million shortfall and eat into our fund balance, as you've shown here. Yes. We have to find another way around it. Now, if we were going to have a TRE, we're currently at a dollar six. Mm -hmm. The first dollar is subject to recapture. The next six cents are not. But the, uh, the next 11 cents are subject. That's tier three. And that's subject to recapture. What does that copper penny yield in terms of tax revenue? How, if we were going to have a TRE, how, what kind of an increase would we be looking at to yield any significant and sustain, sustainable uh, revenue that would help our district? So the, uh, um, uh, you're, you're right on track with the, with the copper pennies and the tiers. Um, so what we'd be looking at is that the additional 11 pennies, if we went for a TRE, uh, doesn't mean if we went to up to $1.17, we would necessarily have to take all the pennies if we got, got authority to, uh, to do so. But the value, depending on the, where we're at on, on our uh, value per watt at the time, uh, should still be in excess of $3 million to us for every penny. $3 million. So if we took another 11 cents, that's 33 million. Yes, sir. And then, uh, but if we, the state would, I think, did you, did I read that our uh, appraised value within the Fort Bend ISD political subdivision is now up to $36 billion. So we would take 36 billion divided by a hundred times 11 cents divided by WADA. And if that number exceeded 319,000, the delta would be remitted back to the state. There would be some recapture. Uh, we haven't run the numbers. It's it's close to it's close to a hundred to three hundred thousand per per penny, just per depending. Penny. And so we would have to we would have to look at that. So is it three million less three hundred thousand or is no it plus? I mean, in, 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 we would we would net at least three million per. Okay. Penny. All right. Thank you. And we, but we can have, we will obviously have a lot more on that in the future if that's something we would end up recommending. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Mr. Rosenthal. So, um, our values are at 3% for 1819. That's kind of the, the prediction. Yes. Sir. Right? Where last year they were at uh, six, six percent. Okay. So, um, shouldn't the state this year then, 2018, 19, if that 3% holds be increasing? Well, their, their it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Um, you know, I was trying to keep the number of slides down, but you know, if we were looking at the, at the bar chart before, as you're going down, the state is behind a year. Right. And, and so it takes them a while to, so we have to wait to till that. next year till they catch Yes. The rate there. Okay. I, I didn't know when the lag started. So that's okay. So we're still this year. We're going to get sure. I, I imagine if we showed state revenues, it would still be decreased for 2018, 19. Yes, sir. Okay. That's what I want to know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Okay. Let's proceed. Okay. So uh, we haven't spoken about debt service. I'll try to get through this quickly, but our outstanding principal is 963 million. Uh, about 17% of that is, is variable rate. Um, the important th things on this slide is that we've maintained our double A rating with both Fitch and Sanders and Poor in the past transaction we did, which was, you know, it's good to be able to have a rating of that, that, uh, that high. And we still have 193 million outstanding, uh, in terms of, you know, from the, from the bond 2007, that's still the remainder for the middle school. And then, uh, uh the rest from bond 2014. Uh, we did just have a refunding. If you didn't see the uh, the memo that we put out last week, uh, we did the refunding. Uh, we saved 15.6 million from this transaction. We've saved almost 60 million since 2014 in our uh, refundings that we've done, uh, which certainly helps out. The uh, uh, all-in cost for that over 3.4 percent. So we feel like it was a successful transaction. We have lots of activity coming up. We'll still be doing the taxable bonds later for the uh, CT center. And then we have another opportunity to save a lot uh, whenever we do the 2000, uh, the refund the 2009 bonds uh, coming up here in the future because the total part for that's over 162 million. Uh, commercial paper, we're still going through with that. 
uh, to date, we've saved 5.7 million uh, in uh, interest cost using the commercial paper program. So, uh, so we've been successful with that. We have six million outstanding now. Uh, as we continue to spend on bond 2014 and finishing out 2007, we'll continue to issue commercial paper until we have to fix that out later. Uh, so just how's it, how's it going from our weighted average maturity? The weighted average maturity of our debt is under 15 years, which is you know enviable in comparison to our peer districts. And that's financing a weighted average useful life of, of 21 years. And so we're, we're really in good shape in terms of how our, how our debt is comparing to the average useful life. So we're going to continue to press ahead on our debt service strategies. You've, we've talked about these before. And I just want to get to the numbers here because I know you're interested in those. Uh, we, uh, we estimate breaking even in 1718. Uh, we originally had planned you know, to have a surplus of up to 10 million, but again, we uh, uh, put in 11 million paying off debt early as part of this last transaction. So we're you know, breaking even in 1718 and we still have a you know, very healthy fund balance. Um, and right now we're looking at, with the numbers the way they're coming in now, uh, uh, a 8.4 uh, budgeted surplus for 1819. Again, looking at, we'll always be looking at ways to uh, uh, retire some debt early if we if we can do that okay child nutrition let me let oh, me sorry. stop you yeah do we have questions from the trustees mr rice sorry. mr bassett thank you very much for that uh how much did i hear you say we have saved through our commercial paper and variable and refunding and variable rate the commercial paper savings so far is 5.7 million. But but all in with refunding for lower interest rates and so forth. Whenever we refunded bond issues uh, since 2014, when we got you know, aggressive with that, uh, we've saved 59.6 or 4.4 million. 59.4? 0.4 or 0.6, I don't remember, but almost million. 60 million. Yes, sir. Almost 60 million dollars. Uh, what is the uh, what is the amount in our fund balance? So oh, it's right there. Mm -hmm. Fund balance sixty five million right now. Uh, no, I'm sorry, seventy two uh, million. We anticipate ending the year with sixty four million in fund balance. Okay, so we have a Standard and Poor's double A plus, and what was the other one? Moody's. Uh, Fitch. Fitch. Double A plus. Double A both. plus. So is that good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The the. Triple A is um, you know, where we could go potentially, but but double A plus is very very strong in, in comparison to our peer district. So next time I see the governor, I'm going to tell him it's stronger than battery acid. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice, Mr. Rosenthal. Yes, um, Steve, when you get a chance, could is there any way that you could create like a sensitivity diagram since we're talking about an upcoming bond here? Um, and um, you know how you've, you've done those in the past, you know, where you've got, you know, assuming a certain CAD value growth yes. by date, you know, that, that curve. Is there a way you can do something like that that shows what our current, you know, cash, you know, INS cash flow, yes, whatever, um, will cover, you know, uh, dependent on certain um, amounts of bond? Yeah, bond scenarios, know, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. that, that's something we could send out. Yeah, I, I think that would be very interesting to see, you know, since we're talking about yes, sir. You know, throwing things in and not things. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Okay. Rocking along. Child nutrition. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief on this, but but we've, we've had a, uh, uh, we've had turnover in leadership in child nutrition. Uh, we've made a lot of changes recently, but we've increased participation. We've, we've done a lot to improve the program. We've uh, been reducing costs, more student involvement. Um, there's a lot that we're working on. We was on the phone today with Greg Gibson. We're getting that audit scheduled uh, for, for later this year. And uh, so we're going to be looking at how the, how the C&D fund could be helping the general fund more in the future. This is a very important chart, though. You know, pictures worth a thousand words. Our participation has gone up significantly uh, over, the past, uh, over the past few months. So we're very optimistic with, with how this is uh, how this is heading. Uh, we're um, what are we going to be doing in the future? We're going to be we're going to be introducing an interactive menu app. There's going to be a lot that can be done with that, and so um, you know we're real excited about that. Uh, the district overall is looking at ID cards, okay. And once once that's implemented, the kids can really go through the line quicker 
if they can just scan you, know, you won't have the, the little ones punching in their numbers and forgetting in their numbers. You, know, you really have, could, could really have a uh, uh, speed up the line. Uh, we're going to be doing grab and go breakfast, um, more cu better customer service. We're trying to have more meaningful student involvement, uh, new menu offerings, promotions, uh, all kinds of things to increase participation. This is what we're projecting in the coming year. You know, based on the, the trends we've seen, we're, we're uh, optimistic that we can have that this can happen. I was speaking to the uh, all of the uh, the cafeteria managers this past Friday. Uh, Mr. Ryan was there to congratulate some of the folks on the graduation. And uh, these ladies were excited when they when they saw these numbers. They were definitely uh, optimistic that they could make this happen. They were really really pleased with how it's going so far. Uh, we can decrease expenditures. Uh, there's some things with our work calendars that aren't aligned with industry standards. Uh, we're going to reduce overtime. Uh, use uh, be a little bit smarter in our commodity processing, uh, paper goods. You may have seen some of the emails on that, or you know, we're looking to reduce that. Uh, we really, uh, and then there, we're going to reduce printing costs by implementing the digital app. Uh, we're really going to try to work harder on uh, staff recruitment and retention. There's a lot of things we're doing there. Uh, the ladies are really happy to see this, especially the bottom number, bottom line there. Investment in supplies. You know, we've held back on some of the investments in the in the uh, kitchens in the past uh, to the extent that it even you know uh, uh, hindered safety. And so we've gotten oven mitts for them and a lot of other things for them that they've been asking for some time. So we've uh, made made some progress there. Uh, we are going to need to look at a new software for child nutrition. Uh, that'll uh, uh, it's been a long, long time since we've changed that. We're expecting some quite a few enhancements from there. Uh, we'll be getting the food trucks. Uh, how can we uh, participate in the capital replacement and then uh, even more marketing? So here are the numbers for child nutrition. So we uh, we did lose 0.4 million uh, in 16, 17. We're expecting to lose you know close to that in 17, 18. But you got to realize that that's with losing 12 operating days due to Harvey. Okay, and, and there's no there's no payment from FEMA for lost revenue, and, and so we had all of the last lost revenue for 12 days when we were still paying our employees. And so uh, if we had not had Harvey, we're estimated that we would have ended up with about a, a half a million surplus. But uh, what we're going to be looking at for 1819 is to uh, have a surplus of, of about a million. Our free and reduced percentage is coming up to 44 percent. You know, so that's just one of the things that I wanted to to mention. A lot of folks don't think of you know Fort Bend ISD in that way, but that has been growing. Uh, we were at thirty seven percent just you know just a couple three years ago. Any questions on this? Questions? I do. Mr. Rosenthal. No. Mr. Rice. I just want to repeat what I heard you say because I thought we were at thirty seven, thirty eight percent, and now on free and reduced lunch we're at almost forty four percent. Yes, sir. Yeah, we've we've grown, and in, and that's in how many years? Two or three years? Three years. All right, thank you, Ms. Helliger. Yeah, thank you. We've had some major um, weather. What do you call them? Opportunities or events over the last several years. So I mean, we've had every year over the last three years. So are we taking that into consideration for the upcoming planning year? Well. Um, the, I mean, we haven't built in any lost revenue days into this budget. Okay. I mean, we're, we're, I mean, uh, well, no, we, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't done that. I mean, I think we've had Harvey, we've had snow days, we've had rain. I mean, every year over the last three years, we've had some ma major events. I think it's, yeah. it would be prudent for us to take that into consideration with, with the planning of that, right? Just... Thank you, Ms. Helliger. Okay. I think that what's was left? just, you know, what, okay, so. Just what's next? Yeah, upcoming, um, you're going to, you know, there's a couple of agenda items to uh, call for the, call the date for the budget hearing. We have the adoption in June, and uh, we're going to be, you know, having the tax roll in July and August, and we'll be adopting, it's not on here, but we'll be adopting the tax rates, which will be the same. Uh, we'll be adopting those in September. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. Do we have anything else? Thank you for doing that quickly for us. Next up, we have the disaster procurement update. Do we have anything of importance to highlight, Mr. Perez? Uh, yes, ma'am, we do. Just very quickly, we had predicted 5.8 million for once again, and we finalized the phase two contract, and it is 4.6 million. So that is 
nice to rent to y'all. Very good. Any questions from the trustees? Okay, before we break, I want to thank the audience members. I know a lot of you guys have, uh, have left, but thank you guys for being here, for being patient. Thank you for being respectful. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, we are going to convene in closed session, and then we'll come back out and take action. Um, so we will now convene in closed session under the Texas Open Meetings Act, Chapter 551, and those sections listed in the agenda, and for the purpose of a private consultation with the board's attorney on any or all subjects or matters authorized by law. We are now convening closed session.